I want to applaud what uh, Safe Haven has done in putting this together. Uh, it is not easy, but hopefully this is a witness to the world that over a contentious issue, Christians can discuss in a very patient way, gentle way, listening to each other. So thank you very much for this opportunity. As I reflected on the panel of speakers that you have put together, I wonder why I'm chosen. I really do. If you're looking for a theological perspective from a very good theologian, I think you should have invited my colleague. Probably you wanted a biblical perspective. So I asked myself, why the Bible then? I look at a lot of literature being uh, churned up today and the literature available on your table. What is uh, commanding a lot of attention today is experience. I mean, why, why talk about the Bible when everything feels so right? When uh, after coming out it is liberating or not coming out it's liberating. So experience becomes so important. Why, why, why the Bible? Why not just move on, is it? And then let the other three speakers have their peace. Perhaps uh, you may be like me, believing that uh, we have this important relationship with God and we want to love our God. And that the Bible figures largely in this relationship by informing us at least of what God has said or what people in the past thought God has said. And in that sense, the Bible may be authoritative for some of us, if not authoritative, at least inspirational. And because it is authoritative and or perhaps inspirational, we want to make sure that our views somehow chime with the Bible. And I think that's the reason why I'm here. So even though people talk about experience, they do try to show that Am I too close to the mic? Eh? I think I am. Yeah. Uh, loud speaker, sorry. Maybe I don't need the mic. So they, they, where was I now? Yes, even though they think experience is important, they want to see or convince themselves that the Bible supports their position. Either way, whether for or against. So why the Bible? And when you look at the Bible, you'll find that uh, only a handful of passages really speak to the issue. Of course, there are other passages that can construct a framework. And from that framework, you can tackle the issue. But there are only a few passages which are speaking directly to the issue we are trying to touch on tonight. I won't want to spend time tonight going through all of them with you, all the technical arguments, pro and cons, okay? But what I want to say is that uh, from a surface reading of it, from a surface reading of it, many come across or come away with the idea that the Bible seems to be negative or against the homosexual lifestyle. Of course, there's no technical term in the Bible for homosexuality. Whenever the Bible describes the phenomenon, it refers to the act, the homosexual act. And here I meant both the male and the female form. So, only a handful of passages, and these passages are highly contested. So when Christians contest vehemently over the interpretation of the Bible, and if these passages seem to imply that it is negative, what do we do? So, moving from the surface text, what was, some would say is that uh, we must look at the context. You cannot just look at a passage without considering the context. So that's what many have done, many scholars. And of course, context can cut both ways. But when we think of context, we think here of the literary context. Sorry, does it sound technical now? That means that the surrounding text, surrounding passages, the surrounding passages would help at least uh, anchor the meaning of that passage we're considering. And another aspect of context would be historical context. Who are the people they were talking to? What were the, the, the voices that were being listened to? We cannot be anachronistic. Maybe our questions may not be theirs. Or perhaps our questions are exactly theirs. But whether it is one case or the other, it demands investigation. So from text, you move on to context. And after determining the context, you may want to go further. And that has to do with the tenor of the Bible. In other words, if we can be quite sure what Paul said, say, for example, in Romans 1, 26 to 27. And if you're quite sure about the context, say, if you uh, belong to the, uh, the camp that says, the context, from what I understand it, and the text really shows me that Paul understood what he's talking about. He may be addressing even today's phenomenon, and he may be against the homosexual practices found today. Now, even if that is so, you move on to a third level, and that has to do with the tenor of the Bible. So here we are thinking of the Bible as a whole, from the witness which begins in Genesis and all the way to Revelation, what has it to say? So the tenor is important. And here we must grapple with ideas such as the love of God, 
and the key commandment given to us, which is love. We have to grapple also not just with love, but the idea of justification by faith. That is, we are accepted as members of God's family based on faith, not on sexual orientation. Okay? Uh, yeah, amen. That's cool. There are lots of supporters here. Uh, hang on, I've not finished my, my piece yet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> What I conclude you may not like, but anyway. From, uh, <laughs> and then from, from the tenor, we think of story. That is, the story here refers to that of creation, cross, and new creation. And between creation and cross, you get sin. And how, how that colors, and how that affects many of our, our what you call, behavior, our uh, even predispositions <coughs> and the way we conduct our lives. So, in other words, although scripture may speak about God is love, may speak about justification by faith, all these are part and parcel of an ongoing story. And the ongoing story has to do with the redemption of creation through the cross. So these are the parameters we must lay down. And once these parameters are laid down, then we are in a better position to understand the biblical witness uh, with respect to homosexuality or homosexual practices. So I, I think I'm not trying to be neutral here. From my own reading of the evidence, uh, you probably only hear where I stand, I think that Paul, and not just Paul, but the Old Testament is quite uniform in its what they call negative attitude towards the homosexual act. And even when we look at the context cited by many scholars, what most scholars try to do with the historical context is to say that Paul was addressing a different phenomenon. And by that they mean Paul was addressing only exploitative type of relationships. Now the problem with that is that the ancient world is also like our world. They know about exploitative relationships, they know about loving relationships. And Paul speaks generally here. And more importantly, these scholars talk, talk about Paul being beholden to the Jewish position. And if they are right about that, they fail to see one thing. Jewish condemnation of homosexuality never mentioned exploitation. Never. Not even once. Whenever Jews in Paul's time condemn homosexuality, it does so with these reasons. Number one, they think that it obliterates gender distinction. Of course, some would say that gender distinction is therefore male dominance, but that is not mentioned whatsoever. Two. Whenever they condemn it, they also mention not just gender, uh, the importance of gender differentiation, they also mention the importance of being natural as conforming to God's order. You may not agree with them, but I'm telling you how Jews have approached the matter in the past. And thirdly, whenever they condemn it, they mention its futility, by that they mean the lack of procreational potential. That is, it does not lead to offsprings. Now, if this is the case, that means if Paul is beholden to his Jewish context, his criticism of homosexuality is directed at it generally and not at specifically exploitative types. Of course, this may frighten off some of us here, but then we go on the next step. That has to do with the tenor. Supposing we have good so-called homosexual, uh, maybe that's not the term you would use for yourself, but uh, people who are engaged in the homosexual act and yet believe themselves to be good Christians, live out lives of high morality and holy people. What do you do with that? So here the general tenor of the Bible comes in. The part about love, about justification. And from there we see how we may negotiate a kind of a maybe uh, modus vivendi. By modus vivendi, I mean a way forward for all of us to coexist together. And not forgetting the story. And the story speaks of redemption. Now, the word redemption should not be read in a terrible way. It's not just about changing the homosexual. It's about changing all humanity to conform to the true image of God. I'm sure you have lots of questions for me after that, but I thought I should throw right at the very start something controversial here, and I thank you for the time. I forgot one thing, if I may come in, Mr. Chairman. So after, sorry, this is important because my colleague wrote something about it. So at the end, when I ask myself, and when I look at rather the fly given to me, what am I afraid of? I think what I'm afraid of, uh, actually I'm very frightened of many things, three things in particular in connection with this meeting. I'm afraid that we lose sight of the importance of the biblical witness. You may not agree with how I put it, but then I'm afraid we may lose sight of it. So I applaud 
gay Christians who study the Bible hard too. I'm afraid that there may be vitriol or terrible criticism coming from both sides. I think that wouldn't help the cause whatsoever, the Christian cause. Three, I'm afraid that when we tackle this, we think of it as an issue, but actually there are people involved, and people are more important than issues. To think about this, thank you.